As you probably understand from my accent, I'm not really British. Uh, actually, I'm Italian, and uh, three years ago I moved from this part of Italy, which is north of Italy, close to Bologna, uh, to this part of the UK. So north of Italy, south of the UK. If you want to put a picture on the transition, it's like moving from here to there. <laughs> so. In terms of food, it was not a big deal, uh, I can tell you. But it uh, is, is, a nice, is, a vi is a vibrant community, a um, lot of activities, and um, in the end, nice colleagues, that, and I will uh, present some of the data that are also being generated in the UK. Um, so the future of clinical trials in an era in which we have approved drugs is a challenge. Uh, and someone else made this point, and actually who made this point is, is Hal Collard, that, as you know, is the organizer and one of the organizers of this uh, summit. And he wrote in the European Respiratory Journal this year, um, how do we move forward to discover and to bring to the patients uh, new drugs? As you know very well, the drugs that are approved, they decrease the progression of the disease, they have very limited effect on quality of life, uh, they have questionable effect on mortality, and so it's a great start, but clearly the job is not done. So how do we move forward quickly, efficiently, towards the discovery of new molecules? There are three issues, basically. We need to understand the disease better. So we need to target a mechanism in the lung of the patient with IPF. The second issue that we need to target is um, which patient will be enrolled in clinical trial. As you know, clinical trial, they all have inclusion and exclusion criteria because they select a subpopulation of the patient with a specific disease in order to uh, improve the efficiency of the trial. So not any patient with IPF can be enrolled in clinical trial, but there will be specific inclusion and exclusion criteria. So which will be the patient for the next clinical trials? How do we select them? How do we identify them? And third, how do we evaluate if a drug is effective or not? In other words, which is the endpoint that we want to change? We know that currently, the two drugs approved, they decrease the rate of progression as measured by lung function, forced by the capacity. That was the end point of the trial for pyrifenone and for ninterenib. Now, are we keep going using the same end point? Are we moving to new end point? And how we identify and decide this? Now, I will give you some example, just flesh of the potential problems and the potential opportunities that are inside these three issues. So the mechanism. The mechanism, probably we know now that the mechanisms that we have been identifying in animal models of pulmonary fibrosis are not necessarily reliable. We don't have a real reliable model, animal model of IPF. As such, is difficult to identify the mechanism and to manipulate them. Secondly, biomarkers are becoming more important in detecting and tracking potential mechanisms of disease. Third, genetics is emerging as a major component, a major mechanism of this disease. So I think that genetics in IPF has been expanding so much over the last year has been really a success story, and we, we will see that in a little bit. Now, animal model, yes. So we don't have perfect animal model. However, and this is pointed out by uh, this group of uh, Martin Kolb already some years ago, they pointed out we need new robust animal model. But we have an animal model, which is the bleomycin mouse model. So you inject bleomycin in a mouse, inhale uh, bleomycin, and the mouse will develop fibrosis, which look has some feature of IPF. It's not the same, but has some feature. Now, everyone keeps telling, yes, is it is imperfect, is not good, but we need to remember that at least for ninterenib, 
if we look at the mode of action of ninternib, ninternib, which is one of the approved drugs, was effective in reducing fibrosis in two animal models, and these are bleomyces-induced life fibrosis. Both in rat and in mouse, we had evidence that the drug is working. So bleomycin, yes, is not perfect, but at least in the case of ninternib, has been very helpful. So yes, we look for new animal models, but what we have is already informative. Biomarker, so a biomarker is something that you measure and is correlated to something else, is mirroring something else. Uh, we have biomarker of disease activities as an example, typical example, even lung function is a biomarker because it's predicting the severity of the disease and the progression of the disease. Uh, imaging, high resolution CT scan is a biomarker. But the way we uh, identify a biomarker now is more related to molecules that we can measure in fluids, in particular in peripheral blood. This is a study that has been conducted in the UK, uh, published this year, uh, and the two colleagues that they did the study are Gisley Jenkins uh, in Nottingham and Toby Meyer in London, and they enrolled the largest court of patients with IPF that has been, have been prospectively followed over time, with no treatment, there was no drugs approved at that time when they started, they want to study the natural history of the disease. It's not a registered study, it's a prospective study, but it looks like some of some what that Dr. Ryerson was telling, it's we need more information about the disease, disease, how they be, how the patient behave. In this study, they also measure biomarkers. In particular, these biomarkers are biomarkers in the blood, and these biomarkers are related to collagen degradation. You know, collagen is the major component of fibrosis in the lung. And uh, the amount of collagen in the lung is considered to be reflected by this small piece of collagen they circulate in the blood. Uh, if you can measure that, it's possible that you are measuring, reflecting the activity of the disease. And what they found, you see, this is a study design they are now, currently they have more than 600 patients enrolled, and they're all in the UK. Um, it's follow-up, there is a lot of information here. And what they did found is that actually, these two biomarkers, I just give you an example of these two, these are two small molecules that you can measure in the blood. The level of these two biomarkers actually is predicting if a patient is more likely to be stable or it most, is more like it's, it's, it's likely to survive more or less if the patient is, if the biomarker is stable or the biomarker is rising over time. Now, this race in the biomarker is three months. So they measure enrollment, one month, and three months. If during these three months the biomarker is stable, then they, there is a lower mortality. If during these three months the biomarker is increasing, then there is an increase in mortality. So it's suggesting that we can measure actually what's going on in the lung by measuring readouts in the blood, which might be very helpful in order to predict the progression of the disease and also to design clinical trial. Yes, genetics is emerging, is a major component, and there is a lot of studies, and um, I will give you an example of how, how much genetics may be important. I'm sure you know this study. This is a study that has been published in the New England Journal of Medicine, produced by the IPF Net Investigator in the US, sponsored by the NIH, and they asked the question if NAC, N-acetylcysteine, is effective in reducing disease progression. And these are the results. Patient on NAC, and patient in placebo, they progress at the same rate. However, they also genotype patients. They took DNA from all of these patients, from the majority of these patients, and they genotype some genes, in particular one gene, which is called TOLIP, which is considered to be involved in the way microorganisms are elaborated in the lung and in the body of people. Now, this study, which is currently being uh, published in the Blue Journal, which is the mm, most important respiratory journal, is an American journal, is showing that you can stratify patients. There are two types of these 
polymorphism in the gene. And this is the more common CC genotype. So patient with the CC genotype, you can see these are the patients in placebo, these are the patients in NAC, and this is the percent of patient dying. So you see that patients in NAC, if they have this genotype, they die quickly than patients in placebo. So it seems like in this group, NAC is harmful. However, if you take the other group, the other 30% of the patient is the opposite. If they have this TT, tall lip, stratification uh, genotype, now you see the patients in NAC in red, they survive more than the patient in placebo. So there will be a study now exploring NAC and probably a combination of NAC and an antibiotic based on genetic stratification. So genetics is hugely important. Plus, we know that there are many genes, in particular MAC5B and the third mutation, that they can predict about one-third of the disease risk. So it's not a genetic disease and in, in, in the way we identify genetic disease. It's not cystic fibrosis, it's not alpha-1 antitrypsin um, deficiency, but the genetic component is important and will be more and more important both for diagnosis and disease um, risk uh, progression, but also for the use of drugs because it's possible that some drugs will be better positioned for some genetic uh, type than others. The type of patients is something which is clearly important, right? Extremely important. Now we know this, um, that the patients now, the clinical trials, they move over time, and now typically patients are now centrally reviewed in order to assess the diagnosis, in particular for CT scan and for lung pathology. However, there is a risk of narrowing too much this population of patients. And in recent clinical trial, we had high screen failure, like patient that the investigator think is IPF, they send the scan or they send the, the pathology, and centrally someone is telling, no, we don't think it's IPF, or it's not the IPF that we want. Now, these pose severe problems in how then you translate the results of a clinical trial to the larger population of patients. Thirdly, we are starting to deviate because the science of clinical trial is evolving, is changing. I will give you just one example uh, of a deviation. Uh, this is the study that uh, conducted to the approval of Ninteranib. These are two large randomized controlled trials worldwide. They showed that Ninteranib slowed down disease progression as measured by line function. Now, the way we identify a patient here is a slightly different from the way we use now to identify a patient as per guideline. You see, these are patients with honeycombing on CT scan or the pattern of UAP at biopsy, and this is a patient with no honeycombing and no biopsy. This patient, they had to have traction bronchiectasis, which is a different feature. Now, we know now for the first time that these patients, they behave exactly the same in terms of disease progression. You see the black bars are patients on placebo. Plus, they respond exactly to the same, at the same extent to the drug. So this deviation is expanding a little bit the definition that now we have of IPF. And now we know if you have a patient with certain characteristics, with no honeycombing and no biopsy, but with traction bronchiectasis, and you exclude non cause of disease, and you get some other inclusion criteria, then that patient will benefit from the drug and will behave like what we call IPF in the most strict sense. The last point is the end point, and I think this is crucially important. And um, the change in force vital capacity over one year, as I told you, has been the basis for approvals. So the FDA in the US, the EMA in Europe, they approved both perfendon and internip based on a reduction in the FVC decline. It will become more difficult now for new drugs to use the same endpoint. Why? Because the patient will decline less on drug, and then you need to show an effect on that smaller decline. It will become a challenge. So what we do, what we, we try to do, we use some enrichment strategy. Um, 
particularly we will enrich for patients that we think they will progress, and we have seen the biomarker, the collagen biomarker before, which is identify a patient they progress more, so you want patient that progress, and secondly, you will need the biomarker that will also identify the mechanism of your drug. And so you can select that as an endpoint because then in early phase clinical trial, if you see a change to that mechanism, it means that you are engaging your target. The third one is an obvious point, is the last point that I want to make, is an obvious point for an audience like this, and, but it's critically important. Now, FVC is something which is measured, uh, but it's a measure which is not related necessarily to the way the patient feels. Um, so the patient reported outcomes, they remain, even today, the ideal endpoint. However, research, which is moving forward, is difficult. It's difficult to study patient reported outcome, it's difficult to get the precision level of being used in a clinical trial, and then you need to have the regulators accepting. So we have the opening uh, talk uh, from the FDA representative yesterday, and she was clearly to the point to the, that patient reported outcome is important. So just to give an example of a classical patient reported outcome that you everyone will understand, cough, amount of cough. Can we reduce that? Can we stop cough? there will be a perfect patient-reported outcome. The problem is that we don't know how to measure it in a standardized, reproducible, solid way. That's why we need research. And in terms of the enrichment strategy, this is something which is moving forward. This is a new drug, is in phase two, is a monoclonal antibody towards an integrin, and we know now that if you measure that target in a surgical lung biopsy, the amount of expression will tell you the fate of the patient. Now, if we can target that drug to the patient that express more, the integrin, then we know that we may target this patient that will survive less, and if we can change this, then we, so we, will, we will know that we are targeting the right target. Last point, again, patient reported outcome. There is a lot that you can read. There is a lot that you can um, see. This is, is just one of, I would say, of the last paper that has been published. And you see that uh, Dan Rose, which has been the founder of the PFF, is among the authors, is an open access journal, BMC Medicine, so you can go and download without need of for any subscription. subscription. Uh, there are a series of articles on IPF, so I strongly encourage you to download and to read this. And this is really making the point, the need for patient-centered clinical research in IPF. And the point that they are making is it is time to refocus on a patient-centered approach with regard to co-investigator role, PRO development, patient-reported outcome, and research participants. I think we will be witnessing a change here in which patient will be involved in the design of clinical trial, in the discussion of clinical endpoint, and, of course, in the study on how to better identify these patient-reported outcomes and how to use them to develop new drugs. With this, I will thank you very much for your attention.